Vish Mishra, who is now the current president of Thai Silicon Valley, uh, a position I used to hold two presidents ago to come and introduce our final speaker. Vish. Thank you so much, Shridhar. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's, in, it's indeed a huge honor for me to introduce Dr. Deepak Chopra. I, of course, you all know uh, he's a man you know, who really does not need any introduction. And I don't know how you introduce somebody who really does not need an introduction. But I'll just say one thing. I have got to know Deepak Chopra's family very well personally, and his personal source of pride. His son-in-law, Suman Mandal, is my partner at my firm. And I met his daughter, his son, um, and he's just a wonderful family. One thing that we had him do at Thai Silk and Valley in 2000, it was just like the last day of Taikon in 2002, and we had Dr. Deepak Chopra for the first time on a panel with the two Nobel laureates. One is a Nobel uh, Prize winner in physics, the other one was in economics. And I'm not telling, I'm not kidding you though, 2,000 people just like what we see here in this hall tonight, and there was absolute pin drop silence. Nobody's moved, no, no soul stirred, and every word that was uttered in the room was just, you know, just absorbed. And many people say, gee, what does he talk about? Of course, he really will take you to a higher level of consciousness. And what a great way to end this conference to really elevate all of our consciousness level to a much, much higher level. So let me introduce again the one and the only, the rare man on the face of this earth who makes India proud, who makes the world proud. He's a truly global citizen, Dr. Deepak Chopra. Thank you very much. So, uh, how's everyone? What do you want to talk about? What do you want to talk about? Okay, happiness. Um, I'll speak for 40 minutes and then um, open it up to questions. How's that? Okay. So, of course, the topic here is uh, changing the nation, leading the world. So, I presume that uh, we're going to do it, that India is going to transform and also lead the world. And for that, you need two things. You need finesse and you need timing. You know, the old model was about force and control. And the new model is finesse and timing. And in many ways, India is, at this moment, primed for leading the world in what social scientists call a phase transition. A phase transition is when there's a complete shift in a total system. So right now, we have a system where there's ecological devastation, where there are extreme economic disparities, where there is radical poverty, where 50% of the world still lives on less than $2 a day, where there is war and terrorism, and where there is social injustice. This is a systems failure. And it's a systems failure that comes from a model that is based on a science which is about 300 years in the making. And we call this science a Newtonian worldview named after the English physicist Isaac Newton, whose basic premise was that if you know the laws of mathematics as they knew then, or physics as they knew then, then everything can be predicted, that everything can be stabilized, that ultimately we will have a system that will produce a balanced world. That system of thinking is now falling apart. And in many ways, it's the demise 
of the postmodern Western world. All, all the problems that you see in the world today come from that model. It's also called a reductionist worldview because the premise again is that if I can understand the parts, I will be able to predict the whole. So I think India at this moment is primed to lead the world because India is culturally sophisticated. India has a very interesting diversity of thought. India has um, a history, a spiritual inheritance that uh, offers a new science. India also has uh, very good intellect. It's uh, quite amazing to see the influence India is having, not only in the Indian diaspora, but everywhere else in the world. And so in the next 10 years, you will see a lot of Nobel Prizes in a lot of fields, in physics, in biology, in chemistry, in many other fields. Well, having said that, let me uh, share with you what the new paradigm is. A paradigm is a whole system of thought, a whole worldview. So our current paradigm is what we call a materialistic paradigm based on the laws of physics as they predict the motion of objects in the physical world. But that paradigm is, as I said, falling apart. The new paradigm says that there are no structures in the real world there are only processes, and these processes exist in our consciousness. Now, that's a lot to say, but let me explain to you what I mean by that, okay? The human body, for example, is a process. Your physical body is not a structure, even though it appears to our perception to be a structure. Your physical body is a process that is in exchange, dynamic exchange, with the elements and forces of the universe. So, through the processes of eating, breathing, digestion, metabolism, elimination, thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, memories, dreams, imagination, creativity, insight, intuition, we are constantly influencing the process that is our body. Your physical body that is here right now, sitting on these chairs, listening to my lecture, is not the physical body that you came in with a little while ago when you came into this room. And we can take a number of processes, but just take one, breathing. With every breath that you breathe in, you breathe in 10 to the power of 22 atoms from the physical universe. 10 to the power of 22 means 10 followed by 22 zeros. That's a lot of stuff. So every breath you breathe out, you breathe in 10 to the power of 22 atoms. Every breath you breathe out, you breathe out 10 to the power of 22 atoms that come from every cell in your body. So at the atomic level, you're literally breathing out bits and pieces of your heart and kidney and brain tissue. And technically speaking, we are all intimately sharing our organs with each other all the time. Now I'm not speaking metaphorically, I'm speaking literally. Right this moment, you have in your body at least a million atoms that were once in the body of Christ, or Buddha, or Genghis Khan, or anyone else you want to think about. In just the last three weeks, a quadrillion atoms, quadrillion means 10 followed by 15 zeros, have gone through a body that have gone through the body of every other living species on this planet. So think of a tree in Africa, think of a peasant in China, think of a camel in Saudi Arabia, think of a taxi driver in Manhattan, and you have stuff in your body that was circulating there three weeks ago. In less than one year, you recycle 98% of all the atoms in your body. So at the atomic level, you make a new stomach every five days. You make a new skin once a month. A new skeleton every three months. Your, um, your skeleton is hard solid, it looks permanent, but it's actually made up of calcium and phosphorus and a few other elements that come and go uh, completely reshape your skeleton in three months. And your DNA, which is your gen 
genetic code, the actual raw material of your DNA, the carbon, the hydrogen, it um, comes and goes every six weeks. Even though your DNA holds memories of millions of years of evolutionary time. So I don't know if you know, but 60% of your DNA is the same as a banana. And 80% of your DNA is the same as a mouse. 98% of DNA in you is the same as a monkey. Something else is happening then. Your physical body is not who you are. This is my year 2009 model. The last time I came to India, I brought with me a different body. That body is dead and gone. It came from the dust, it recycled around what I call myself. It's back in the dust, it's circulating in other life forms. But um, I'm still here. So who's the me that outlives the death of the molecules through which I express myself? I'm not this physical body. This is recycling of the ecosystem. Earth, water, air, all the elements, the five elements, which our ancient rishis call the five Mahabhutas. So if I'm not my physical body, then who am I? Because this is the key on which the new transformation if we want to lead the world, we have to completely have a new way of looking at ourselves. So, William Shakespeare in one of his plays says, We are such stuff that dreams are made on. It's a beautiful expression. In one of his plays, The Tempest, he says, We are such stuff that dreams are made on. And the great rishis of India said, our body is just the place that our memories and our dreams come home, call home for the time being. Our bodies are just the place that our memories and our dreams call home for the time being. Now can we look at this scientifically? Because I, I do not believe anymore, it's a very interesting sentence I was going to utter before I caught myself, because I think the new paradigm cannot be based on belief. Belief, in my view, is a cover-up for insecurity. If I told you, do you believe in electricity, you would say that's a ridiculous question. I can see it, the effects of it. Do you believe in gravity? You would say that's a ridiculous question. So, if God is real, if your soul is real, if your spirit is real, if your consciousness is real, then you should not have to rely on belief. You should have to rely on evidence, on knowledge, and on experience. That's how science is done. So today if I could look at you as you really are, not through the perceptual artifact of my senses, but I could look at you through the eyes of a modern scientist, I would say that your body is made up of atoms. The atoms are subatomic particles that are moving at lightning speeds around huge empty spaces. And those subatomic particles are not things. The subatomic particle is not a thing, even though we call it a thing. It's a fluctuation of energy and information in a huge emptiness. So seen through the eyes of a physicist, your body is proportionately as void as intergalactic space. If I could see it as it really is, I would see a huge emptiness with a few scattered dots and spots and some random electrical discharges. Because as we go beyond the appearance of molecules, you enter a subatomic cloud and when you go beyond the cloud, you end up with nothing. You end up with absolutely nothing. And the crucial question in science today is, what is this nothingness from where we all come? Is it just a void or could it be the womb of creation? Is it possible that nature goes to exactly the same place to create a galaxy of stars or a cluster of nebulas or a rainforest or a human body or a thought? What's a thought? Where does it come from? And after you've had the thought, where does it disappear? You know, people have asked these questions for thousands of years. People have offered answers for thousands of years. 
and in fact some of the best answers have come from our own tradition from the tradition of the great seers the authors of the Upanishads and particularly the great works of people like the Shishta and Bhrigu and many others is the basic ground of our existence which is an emptiness is it a nothingness or is it the womb of creation as I said to you this no longer has to be an esoteric philosophical metaphysical conundrum this has to be based on our current understanding of what we call reality so today if I can use my Blackberry if I can use my internet if I can surf the information highway if I can send you email or text message you all these technologies are based on a very fundamental premise in science and what's the fundamental premise in science? the fundamental premise is that the material world is not material that the essential nature of the physical world is that it's not physical that the essential stuff of the universe is non-stuff so what is this non-stuff from where we all come? this is where science at this moment finds itself in a huge perplexity in a huge bewilderment the biggest problem in science today and I'm, you know, my basic training is that I'm a physician I'm a neuroscientist I've studied brain chemistry and what we call neuropeptides and so the basic question in science today is what is the origin of consciousness we are conscious beings you're listening to me because you're conscious you can perceive because you're conscious you can think because you're conscious you can imagine because you're conscious there's nothing that you can do without consciousness and today the biggest question in science is what is the origin of consciousness you know do we indeed have a soul well, in the last century scientists would wonder about the soul they would weigh a person just before they died they'd weigh them again afterwards to see if something left since nothing left they at least came to one good conclusion if you have a soul it probably doesn't weigh anything in our own century there was a brilliant scientist a Canadian scientist who was a neurosurgeon he lived in Canada and he would probe the brain to see where is the choice maker where is the one who imagines where is the interpreter and I don't want to go into his research right now because it's very complicated but basically he could not find the soul in the body that was a hundred years ago now today we have amazing technology today we have things like PET scans and MRIs and CAT scans you can look into every neuron you can look into every synaptic network you can peer into the dark passages, the secret alleys, the ghost filled attics of every little neuron and still nobody has been able to find the soul with everything that we know with everything that we know in science it is impossible to find the soul in your body so would you please I'm asking you for help here if, if you can't if I can't find you in your body then what's the best explanation for it okay the best explanation in science there's a principle called Occam's principle it says when you don't have an explanation the simplest explanation is probably the most likely explanation the reason I can't find you in your body is that you're not in it okay, your body is in your soul your mind is in your soul and in fact the whole universe is in your soul soul meaning your core consciousness now that's a very radical shift from the current worldview that you are not in your body your body is in you you are not in your mind, your mind is in you that you are not in the world, but the world is in you 
the first read about it in Bhagavad Gita. When Lord Krishna says, Kervin Bhak, Prakratim Swam Vashtabhai Vishrajami Puna Puna. Kervin Bhak, within myself, I create again and again. Kervin Bhak, within myself, I create the mind, I create the body, and I create the whole universe. Now that's a profound insight that modern science is just beginning to glimpse, okay? So today, all our new technologies, as I said, are based on the principle of subatomic particles that move in and out of empty space at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. So if you could see the world as it really is, you see it's a huge electromagnetic storm that's going on and off at the speed of light. This phenomenon in science is called a discontinuity. Discontinuity because it's going on and off. It's like when you go to see a movie. When you see the movie you see continuity on the screen, but when you go to the projection room you realize that the movie is a series of still frames that goes on and off. If I move the reel fast enough, then I cannot see the on-off and my consciousness creates the experience of continuity. I see a motion picture instead of still frames being flashed on and off. That's what a discontinuity is. Our experience of the world is a continuity in our consciousness, but actually the world is a discontinuity. It's going on and off. Am I clear? So the, the motion picture, you see a neon sign, you know, the valley, you have neon signs around places and the light is moving, but there's no light moving. There are only light bulbs going on and off. But they go on and off at such speed that it creates the illusion of continuity. So the world as is the maya of continuity when in fact it's a vibration which goes on and off. So the question in science today is not what's in the on. We know what is in the on. It's energy and information. We use it in our technology. The big question in science is not what's in the on of the vibrations of the universe, what's in the off? What's in the off? He has a beautiful poem by Robert Frost where he says, we dance around the ring and suppose the secret sits in the middle and knows. What's in between the vibrations? So today, if you go to really good scientists, some Nobel Prize winning scientists in the field of fundamental particle physics, they'll say they at least agree on five attributes of the discontinuity. The first is that in the discontinuity, there's no energy, there's no information, there's no space-time, and there are no objects. There's no energy, there's no information, there is no space time, there are no objects. So what's there? And the best answer that science can give us is there are infinite possibilities. That the discontinuity is pure potentiality. That the discontinuity is a superposition of fields of possibility. A matrix of probability clouds in a field of possibilities. The second attribute of the discontinuity is that it's a field of what science calls non-local correlation. Non-local correlation means everything is correlated instantly with everything else. Now again, it takes a lot of time to explain this to you, so I'm not going to, in the time we have, uh, go into it in deep detail, but this phenomenon is also called quantum entanglement, which means Everything in the universe is connected to everything else and this connection is faster than the speed of light which really distressed Einstein because according to Einstein's theory of relativity nothing can happen in the universe faster than the speed of light. Okay? But according to the principle of non-local correlation everything is correlated all at once, instantly. And that includes past, present and future because distance in space is also distance in time. A field of total correlation. 
then there's a lot of scientific evidence there, not just theoretical, mathematical, that in nature things happen all at once, including the human body which is part of nature. The human body, for example, has a hundred trillion cells, which is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Every cell is performing a hundred thousand activities every second. Every cell instantly knows how to correlate its activity with every cell. How does a human body think thoughts, play a sitar, make antibodies, kill germs, regulate the heartbeat, make a baby all at the same time, simultaneously? And while your body can do that, it monitors the movement of stars and planets because your biological rhythms are the symphony of the whole universe. There is a Sanskrit shloka in the Upanishads that summarizes quantum entanglement. Yatha pinde, tatha brahmande. As is the atom, so is the universe. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. As is the human body, so is the cosmic body. So these days of course you know about fractals and holograms and all the new information that's coming out. But your body is actually a cosmic computer that's linked to the infinite intelligence of the universe. Again, Atman is Brahman. Brahman is the consciousness field, what scientists today also call the zero point energy field. Because if you, if you, if you take all the forces of the universe, all the electromagnetic forces, the strong and weak interactions, the gravitational forces of the universe, electrical forces, electromagnetic forces, you add them all up, what you get is zero. So it's called the zero point energy field, but that zero contains infinity. It's Brahman. Okay? And the whole universe is the expression of that which in Sanskrit is Brahman. The universe is contained in Brahman. It's the differentiated expression of Brahman. Second attribute. The third attribute is, again without going into details, the discontinuity proliferates with uncertainty, which means that at the most fundamental level, nature's laws become unpredictable. Well, that drives scientists totally crazy, because if, if nature becomes unpredictable at a fundamental level, how do you do science? Science is based on laws that are predictable. So that was also one of the big dilemmas for Einstein. He could not accept quantum entanglement, he could not accept uncertainty. In fact, one of his famous remarks, Einstein said, God does not play dice with the universe. Well, Stephen Hawking recently made a statement, he said, God not only plays dice with the universe, God throws the dice where you will not find it. There's a level of nature that totally bewilders the human intellect, including every mathematical principle that we know. Third attribute. Fourth attribute is what is called quantum creativity. Quantum creativity is when you have a shift in context in meaning, and you have a new context in meaning and there is no transition. This is a creativity that cannot be programmed into a computer because all computer programs are based on mathematical principles called algorithms. But what about the creativity that says the heck with the algor algorithm? I create something that never existed before. Okay. How does a banana become a human being? using the same elements and forces, the same DNA. And there's a lot of other examples of quantum creativity. So infinite creativity. Quantum creativity is also infinite creativity. Nature, nature is in, infinitely creative and has infinite imagination. It's fourth attribute. The fifth attribute, and this is the most confounding attribute of the discontinuity, is what scientists refer to as the observer effect. The observer effect. First described by a great scientist called John Wheeler, who died last year at the age of 97. He was a student and colleague of Albert Einstein. 
and John Wheeler about 40 years ago made the proposition that the physical universe does not exist unless there's a conscious being looking at it. So if there's no conscious beings looking at the physical universe, it would not exist. The conscious being can be you, it could be a mosquito, it could be something that has sentience, that has consciousness. If a conscious being is not looking at the universe, it remains a vibration. The vibration becomes color and sound and form and texture and taste and smell, not in your brain but in your consciousness. In your consciousness. So having given those five attributes, the next, next big leap is that the discontinuity is you. You are not in your brain, you are not in your thoughts, you are in between your thoughts. Okay? You are in the discontinuity. And that is where there is infinite potential, there is infinite knowledge, because non-local correlation means infinite knowledge. It means omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. So, in that little space between your thoughts, you have infinite potential, you have infinite knowledge, you have infinite creativity, you welcome uncertainty because the proliferation of uncertainty is the leap of creativity. If a system is totally certain, there is no possibility of creativity. And you are the observer effect. Without you, the universe doesn't exist. That's where science meets the sage. The best scientists today are coming together with the sages of the ancient wisdom traditions, of which ours is the most ancient, to say consciousness is not an epiphenomenon, consciousness is the ground of being that differentiates into space-time, energy, information and the whole universe. Well, if that's the truth, then we better get in touch with this consciousness because otherwise we are screwed, basically. And of course in, in the Vedanta they say, know that one thing by knowing which everything else is known. Know that one thing by knowing which everything else is known. And that's you. So my friends, before I go further, I'd like you to try something. I know you're listening to me. Now thank you. But as you're listening to me now, just turn your attention to who's listening. So as you're listening to me, become aware of who's listening, the listener. I hope you feel the presence. Because if you do, that's your soul. It's not your mind which might be saying, I wish I'd gone to the bathroom before the lecture, or what am I going to have for dinner, or why didn't you return my call, or whatever. There's a consciousness in which a thought comes and goes. Okay, the thought comes and goes, but the consciousness is there. A consciousness in which a perception comes and goes. An emotion comes and goes. An idea comes and goes. A body comes and goes, because once upon a time you had the body of a baby, a teenager. You have this body now, tomorrow you'll have another body, and then it'll be gone. But the great wisdom traditions, again, are great wisdom traditions in the Upanishads. They say, hold on to this part of yourself because it's the only part that's real. Everything is a, else is an impermanent, transient pattern of behavior of your consciousness. And your body is not who you are, your mind is not who you are, your personality is not who you are. You are the producer, the director, the hero and the villain of the story you are writing in your own consciousness. And if you don't know what this consciousness is, then you are in trouble. Because everything else then becomes a reductionist, this problem or that problem. Now, you know, this is wonderful ancient wisdom that we have inherited here in our country. 
Today, the world of technology is moving so fast that it, our mind reels in bewilderment. I don't know if you, you know, you so take for granted your little cell phones and your technology. Do you know how old the internet is? 1995. It's not even 20 years old. Okay. See where we are with Silicon Valley, with all of you as entrepreneurs making billions of dollars based on information technologies. It's not even 20 years old. Today, technology is doubling every year, the power of technology. And it is doubling every year, which means the growth of technology is exponential. What does that mean? It means that in 10 years, the power of technology will be a million times what it is today. In 10 years, in another three decades, it will be a billion times what it is today. It's beyond your imagination. You know, I just came from a conference at MIT where I was looking at nanotechnology, which is now, of course, I believe there's going to be a nanotechnology park soon in Gujarat. Uh, the person who's going to head that is a friend of mine by the name of Anita Goyal, who's an MD, PhD from Harvard, has degrees in physics, in, uh, in uh, medicine, and in neuroscience. And Anita Goyal is going to be coming here. She's funded by Boston Science and many of you in Silicon Valley, if you're here. And this is a woman who knows science, but she also understands consciousness. Because the amount of information we're going to get in the next few years, you cannot handle it. It's impossible. Your mind will reel with bewilderment. You know, you're going to have nano robots that to clean up your arteries, you'll have uh, desktop computers that will make your food for you if you want, with any flavor. You'll have genome replication, which we'll be able to take a piece of saliva and create a new heart, a new brain, a new kidney if you want. The marvels of technology are the marvels of human consciousness. Don't be don't be so impressed by the technology. You should be impressed by yourself because that's where it's coming from. But as I said, as we move from the information age into the age of the understanding of consciousness, we are going to have to handle things a little differently. We're going to have to understand that the most fundamental field of creation is a single field. And it exists outside of space-time. Again, to quote the Gita, when Lord Krishna talks about Atman, he says, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, fire cannot burn it, because it's ancient, it's unborn, it does not have any ending. And today, if you talk to the best physicists, they say the real nature of reality is that it is beyond space and time. It is no edges in space, it has no corridors in time. In fact, time and space are created in consciousness. Well, this has huge implications for us, for us Indians. Because you know, we are a very interesting country. I also participate as a scientist in Gallup. I'm sure you're familiar with Gallup polls. They we do polls all over the world. Well, one country we cannot poll for most of the important studies is India because there is no sample that tells you about everything that's going on in India. India has so much diversity, it's impossible to get a sample because there's so much imagination, there's so much culture, it's a living mythology at the same time. The stories in the Puranas, for example, have every possible theme that can be enacted on this stage of life from divine to diabolical from sacred to profane from forbidden lust to the highest beautiful expressions of love this is the creativity that is part of our culture China doesn't have it okay, China is everybody talks about China but China is spiritually and culturally bankrupt 
as is Japan, as is all of Southeast Asia. We are the only living mythology that carries its culture for thousands of years. Combine that with the, the, the extraordinary technology that is coming to the world from this country. You know, I'm a product of Pandit Nehru's vision. Many people now look back at India and they say, you know, Pandit Nehru was a social scientist and he was a socialist, but he had the vision. He listened to his early speeches where he said, Kaal Khane banane hai, education honi hai, schools khoelne hai, colleges khoelne hai, IITs shuru karne hai, all India institutes shuru karne hai. We are the product, I am the product of that vision. If it had not been for that, which had 60 years ago, we would not right now be the pioneers at the cutting edge of the next phase transition. So yes, it's possible to lead the world right now, but let us not be remiss. Let us not be just copying what the West did. Let us not go through their, their trials and tribulations. That system is falling apart. Wall Street is gone. A system of economics where 2.9 trillion dollars circulates in the world's markets of which only 2% goes to provide useful goods or services. Is that an economy? A system that believes that weapons are the means to security. A system that allows extreme economic disparities. A system that indirectly furthers war and terrorism in the world. Please, we want to be leaders in the world. Let us not copy the rest. We have the best minds, the best intellects, and we have the proud and great tradition of India's spirituality. Let me show you a few slides, because I don't know, I might be... What time is it? No? Okay. So, what do you see here? What do you see? Do you see a man playing a saxophone? Or do you see a woman's face? Which is it? What's on the screen? On the screen, there are photons that are coming to your nervous system. Whether you see a man playing a saxophone or a woman's face is a choice in consciousness. It's what we call the observer effect. You see a face here, but do you see a word? The word is liar, L-I-A-R. The beautiful, again, poem of the English visionary poet, William Blake, where he says, we are led to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye that was born in the night to perish in the night while the soul slept in beams of light. So unless you wake up the soul, Atma Darshan, Turiya, Transcendence, you will see the world as a lie, the Maya. Because the world is not out there, it's in your consciousness. And your consciousness exists outside of space-time. Do you see the young girl looking into the distance? And how many of you can see her mother-in-law? Daughter-in-law or mother-in-law? Father-in-law, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. You see a bird, you see a rabbit.
this is the contribution of the Western colonial empire to the world. It comes from a reptilian brain, which is 300 million years old in evolutionary time. Okay, which means just me. I'm here for me. I'm going to create, this is the world we have created as a result of that consciousness. This is the world we have to heal because the knowledge is here. Could we create a new world? And for that, we need a total shift, a radical mutation in our own consciousness. We need Dhyan Dharma Samadhi where you can actually see yourself as that one energy field that is the energy and the power of the universe. It's a very lofty ambition. It's a very lofty idea. But if we had a critical mass of that consciousness, we would have this world. We would have a re-emergence of the arts, of music, of mathematics, of biology, of architecture, of culture that would be a new renaissance. That would be a total new renaissance and it is here, right here. Because if you really understand Vedic mathematics, Vedic architecture, Stapatya Ved, or Vedic music, Gandharva Ved, or Vedic mathematics, of the Vedic understanding of biology, you see that indeed we over here are the ones that we have been waiting for. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. We have collected a whole bunch of questions that came to us from via SMS and I'm going to uh, ask a few of those. First question comes from Hemant Mehta and I guess many of us are looking for answers for the same. How do you get moksha? How do you get moksha? Well, moksha is the final stage of Enlightenment. So, according to our understanding of consciousness, we normally, a normal human being goes through three stages of consciousness through their life, waking, dreaming and sleeping. The fourth stage of consciousness is called Turiya. Turiya is when you become aware of the observer in the midst of the observation. You had a little glimpse of that when I asked you to turn your attention to his listening. Okay, so that's called Turiya. And you cultivate Turiya through what is called witnessing awareness or what we call Vipassana. Okay, Vipassana is nothing but witnessing awareness. That's the fourth state of consciousness. The fifth state of consciousness is called Cosmic Consciousness. Or in Sanskrit it's called Turiya Tata. The Turiya Tata is when you become aware of the witnessing awareness in the state of dreams, waking and, and, and sleep. So your body is fast asleep but you are fully awake, you meaning your consciousness is fully awake, looking at your body in the sleep, dream and waking state. With every stage of shift in consciousness, there is a shift in perception, there is a shift in cognition, there is a shift in emotions, there is a shift in personal relationships, and there's a shift in social interactions and there's a shift in the environment because the environment in your environment, your personal environment so because you're creating your own environment as well so the, the fourth state is called cosmic consciousness or Turiya Tata you cultivate that through Bhakti Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Karm Yoga and Raj Yoga Raj Yoga is going inward Karm Yoga is service leaving the results to the unknown, Bhakti Yoga, I would like to call it the yoga of love or compassion or, or, or relationship 
and then Gamio, the understanding of how our intellect expresses its creativity, its imagination, its intention, its insight. So that's called cosmic consciousness. That's the fifth state of consciousness. The sixth state of consciousness is called divine consciousness or refined cosmic consciousness where you are able to see the objects of your perception both locally and non-locally. So, you know, in every state of consciousness you look at a rose, it's a rose. But in, in the fifth state of consciousness when you look at a rose, you can see rainbows and sunshine and earth and water and wind and air and the infinite void and the big bang and the whole history of creation in that rose. And you can feel the presence of consciousness in the rose. This is the realm where dormant potentials wake up. Dormant potentials means looking into the future, looking into the past, extrasensory perception, knowledge of past lives, knowledge of future, remote viewing, remote healing. These are dormant potentials that are very well described in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the Siddhis. Okay? So that's the sixth state of consciousness. And finally, there's the seventh state of consciousness, which is what you're talking about. Moksha. It's a long way there. Okay? Seventh state is unity consciousness or Brahman consciousness, where the witnessing awareness in you and the witnessing awareness that is the awareness of the universe, because the universe is a living organism, you and the universe, the consciousness becomes one. Moksha. Okay? That's the last stage. And the process can take a few lifetimes, but it's an adventure. It's a beautiful story. It's magical. And every opening is an opening of synchronicity, of meaningful coincidences, of magic, of the realm of the miraculous. And that's why I think it's very important that as we explore the outer reaches of technology, we combine this with our understanding of consciousness because otherwise technology will become diabolical. We've already created weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, we've created biological warfare, now we have gene manipulation. So unless we have access to the deeper realms of consciousness, we say that the basic cause of all suffering, the basic cause of all suffering, this is there in the Vedanta, it is there in Buddhism, it's there in all our wisdom traditions, that the fundamental cause of all suffering in the world is the socially induced hallucination of the separate self, which does not exist, which means your ego. Next, next question comes from Sunil. What was the single turning point in your life that made you take this journey? Well, that's a very long story, but uh, uh, there were many turning points. One was my training as a neuroendocrinologist. I could see the connection between consciousness and biology. The second was that as a physician, I was totally perplexed by the fact that you could have two patients who received the same treatments, are the same doctor, got the same Everything was the same, but they had different outcomes. So one person dies, one person lives. So obviously, the model we had, the biological model we had in our science, in our Western science, was incomplete. So that was troubling me. And then the, the real turning point was very coincidental. I was at a conference in Washington, D.C., and I happened to run into uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was very controversial in India at that time, is of course known as the, the guru of the Beatles and very misunderstood but he invited me to his room and he literally chastised me for doing superficial science. He says, come with me and I'll teach you real science. So I ended up spending about 15 years with him. I used to, uh, I used to be at one point carrying his uh, skin, you know, he used to sit on a deer skin so I was his skin boy. I used to go all over the world with him and I really got into Vedanta through his great generosity. Thank you. Next question comes from Vijay. 
what is the connect between entrepreneurship, success, and synchro destiny? Good question. Okay. Success. How do you define success, first of all? Because if you define success purely in financial terms, then you are doomed. So financial success adds 10% to your total happiness experience. All the research shows that. Okay, financial success contributes 10 percent. 40 percent of your happiness experience comes from whether you look at problems or whether you see the same things as opportunities. So happy people look at what other people look at as problems they see as opportunities. Okay, they have a shift, and just like you saw the shift in those pictures. They have a quantum shift. And then there's a remaining 60% of your happiness experience which comes from everyday choices. You know, the everyday choices, one are purely for personal pleasure. So having a good time, going to a party, having a glass of wine, sex, these are personal pleasures. Do they bring happiness? Yes. But the happiness is transient. It lasts a few hours or most a few days. There's another kind of happiness that comes from meaningful contribution and creativity and voluntary choices that make other people happy. So the easiest way to be happy is to make somebody else happy. Okay, so now with that, success is being happy, success is the progressive realization of worthy goals, including material goals, including entrepreneurship, financial success. Success is also creative expression because you know we are we are creative beings. Unless we have access to our creativity, we are not happy. And if we define success that way, then the new entrepreneurship has to be a holistic entrepreneurship. Okay, right now, if I was to give you and you are investing money, you are putting your dollars or rupees or whatever currency you have into new ventures, please look at wisdom-based economies and wisdom-based technologies. The age of information is over. We are now the next age. You know what, what uh, evolutionary biologists say, we went from the hunter-gatherers to the agricultural age. And you see the sources of wealth depend on the dominant activity of humanity. So when you are hunter-gatherers, then your wealth comes from weapons. When you are in the agricultural age, as we still are in many parts of the world, your wealth comes from agriculture. In the industrial age, your wealth comes from machines, from oil, from minerals, from natural resources. In the information age, your wealth comes from a microchip. What's a microchip? It's a piece of silicon dust with information in it. But now as we move from the age of information into a holistic age of wisdom where the number one trend in the world, again, working with Gallup, we track future trends. So would anyone tell me what the number one trend in the world is? The number one trend in the world in one phrase is well-being. Well-being of our human biology, well-being of emotions, well-being of relationships, well-being of businesses, because if businesses are totally, totally focused on shareholder value, you're doomed. Because right now, you have to shift from shareholder value to every stakeholder in the business. So the stakeholders include, of course, investors, employees, customers, communities, and the ecosystem. I'm wearing this shirt, by the way. This is, this is a biodegradable shirt. After I'm done with it, I can bury it and it will fertilize the rose garden. So this is the new technologies, okay? So you want to invest in entrepreneurship? Look at wisdom-based technologies. Look at genomics. Look at, um, uh, look at selective cloning, look at nanotechnology, 
look at biodegradable manufacturing, look at ecosystems, look at so much, uh, uh, look at uh, nano robots. That's where the new imagination is going. So, you know, the best thing we could do as entrepreneurs is really exercise our imagination and our creativity looking into the future. Your imagination and creativity does not come from your brain. Your imagination and creativity comes from your soul. So you have as much imagination as an Einstein. You have as, because you know, your soul is the field of infinite possibilities. It's pure potentiality. So please do not underestimate your capacity for imagination and creativity. And as entrepreneurs, you should be tracking future trends. And that information is available. You can have that information right now. If you want to track the thousand most important trends that all have to do with well-being, by the way, including the well-being of ecosystems, that's where you should put your money. And that's where you should put your imagination. That's where you should put your creativity. And also, by the way, this is an interesting time because you're all familiar with crowdsourcing, right? You're all familiar with, with cloud computing. This is an amazing time because cloud computing and crowdsourcing is harnessing collective imagination, collective data assemblies, collective creativity, and collective intentionality. You give me a difficult case in medicine, just any difficult case. I can go to the, all the sources, or I can go on Yahoo, where I have access to the world's best minds in medicine, and I can ask them one question, how do I deal with this case? And I do that, by the way. Because Yahoo, uh, we are doing an experiment right now called Yahoo Answers. Maybe you've seen it. Okay, so I participate in Yahoo Answers by creating the questions. We pose a question, and within 24 hours, you have 50,000 answers from all over the world. And you look at those answers, you have a few that are the solution. So today, please do not think of yourself. Harness collective networks of imagination and creativity. Create those here in India. Create collective networks. Create crowdsourcing. Create uh, collective intentionality. Collective imagination. Collective creativity. That, we hardly have the technology for that. I'm going to ask one last question from the SMS bank and then if you have uh, some time then we'll do face-to-face -face audience questions. This question comes from Samuel Mehta. With what you explained here today, how would you define death? Death is creativity. Death is creativity and let me explain that to you. Nature, I just explained to you, is um, a discontinuity, which means it goes on and off. So if you look at the most fundamental levels of nature, subatomic particles appear from an infinite void, then they disappear into the void. So right there, at the level of subatomic interactions, we are seeing Brahma, Vishnu and Maheshwara, right? You hear the emergence of a subatomic particle, it hangs around for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a time, then it rebounds, it disintegrates and it disappears. Okay? This is the dance of creation at the most fundamental level. And it's the dance of creativity because as soon as it disappears, then something else emerges. Okay? It's quantum creativity at the most fundamental levels. But that dance of what we call the on and the off, it's the on and the off of nature, it's occurring at several levels. Your cells, your stomach cells die every five days. Why? Because new ones are born every five days. Okay, skin cells die every month. If your skin cells did not die every month, you would have very, you would have leathery skin, like an alligator, because this Skin cells of an alligator have a very slow recycling. 
So you can think of the universe as a recycling plant where everything is born, it hangs on for a little bit and then it disappears. It happens at subatomic levels, it happens at molecular levels, it happens at cellular levels, it happens at organ levels, it happens at the level of your body. Because you had a two-year-old body once upon a time, it's dead. Okay, thank God. Right? You had a teenager's body, it's gone. Okay, but not only did you have a two-year body, you had a two-year mind. You had a two-year personality. You had a two-year way of looking at the world. All that is dead. Okay, so in biology, there's a term, it's called apoptosis. Apoptosis. It means programmed cellular death. And cancer is a condition where the cell has forgotten to die. Cancer is the loss of the memory of death. Okay? So cancer cell doesn't know how to die. So it keeps multiplying and ultimately it kills every but it kills the host and it in having killed the host it also dies. Okay. So death is as important as birth. Death and birth are space-time events in the continuum of life. Death and birth are the space-time events in the continuum of life. What you call reincarnation. What is reincarnation? So where do I go after I die? Well, you go into the matrix of probability clouds, which are thought forms, in the zero-point energy field, which in the Vedanta they call the Akashic field. The Akashic field, the Brahman field, from where those thought forms, which are probability clouds, Sanskrit word, Sanskara, Vasnas. What is Sanskara? Sanskara is a probability cloud for a potential thought form that is the statistical probability of space time events. So we don't really go anywhere, we are there right now. That's where your, your thoughts are coming from. So if I ask you, what did you have for breakfast this morning? What did you have for breakfast? Huh? Porridge and, milk. Porridge and milk. So where was that idea of that thought before I asked him? If I went to his brain, would I find some sign for porridge? There's no such thing. That thought, or I could ask him, do you remember your teenage years? Do you remember the house you lived in? Right? Immediately go there. So those potential memories are not actual memories, they are potential memories that exist as probability clouds in the matrix of thought forms, the Akashic field. He went there right now to fetch his memory of porridge. So where do you go after you die? Where that porridge is right now. You don't go anywhere. Well, what happens to the space in this room if the walls collapse? Nothing, right? The space is there. You cannot destroy the space, you cannot create the space, it's there. So you cannot destroy you, you cannot create you, you're there. And all you do is, you go through the dance of creation, maintenance, destruction, incubation, and then a quantum leap of creativity which we call reincarnation. To incarnate, but reincarnation is creativity because you take the same software, so software meaning karma, memories, sanskaras, vasanas, that's the software and you take a leap of creativity and we call it reincarnation. Actually I'm sorry but if I had done this lecture yesterday, today there was a special on CNN, where are special, did you see it Mishit? Dekha? Oh you missed it. And anyway, if you go on CNN the website, go to the website on CNN, look for Larry King, one hour discussion on life after death, uh, which I recorded before I just came, and it's based on what we are discussing now. Okay, without death, this would be a museum. We would all be living mummies in a fossilized universe. Death is what makes the universe fresh. We're going to take a couple of audience questions. Anyone? I don't know. I wonder how to choose, yes. Yeah, hi Dr. Deepak, how can one feel self-actualization? How can one feel self-actualization or experience self-actualization? I think the question was asked when people asked about moksha and I said karma, bhakti yoga, raj yoga, 
and Gyanyo. So in our day-to-day -day working, how can I feel self -conscious? It becomes your lifestyle. Okay. It becomes how you live your life. It's called effortless spontaneity with some cult. That's it. There's no need to plan anything. Yeah. It happens by itself. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for a very provocative analysis, if I may say so. Should I feel odd or should I believe that this is a conceit constructed to validate our insignificant existence? If you look at the earth, it doesn't represent even a grain of sand in the universe as we define it. Uh, yes, as long as, as you think of yourself as a skin encapsulated ego, then you are totally in insignificant. You are, you are a speck, our planet is a speck of dust in a mindless universe somewhere in the junkyard of infinity. So it's totally conceived. But as soon as you shift from me to we to God consciousness, then you are magnificent. So you know, there's a Ruby poem which says, you are not just a drop in the ocean, you are the ocean in the drop. Thank you for that. One last question. What about artificial intelligence? Where does this fit in? Artificial intelligence is coming, okay? Artificial intelligence is coming as is quantum computing coming. And that's why we have to be very careful because the limits of human imagination are just beyond, beyond literal imagination. I just was with a scientist in Boston called Robert Lanza. Robert Lanza is a 35-year-old biologist who came to the San Diego Zoo exhumed an ox that was uh, that was uh, that had died 30 years ago of an extinct species took some cells of the ox FedEx them to Boston to his lab where he cloned the cells created a zygote FedEx the zygote to New Mexico and he has now created an ox that had died 30 years ago okay so we are entering Jurassic Park right now as we speak that's one level of intelligence with genes and cloning and selective cloning, but there's another level of artificial intelligence which comes from looking at feedback loops in nature and how, how information systems will ultimately become consciousness systems. So it's coming. The fact is we as human beings have to realize that even artificial intelligence is really not artificial, it's our creation. It's human intelligence that is creating that artificial intent. We, we're going to take a question from this side of the stage, please. Excuse yes, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, okay, yes. I have this question for you. Uh, sir, I wanted to understand this thing from you, that you are the best person to tell us uh, what the world is thinking about our knowledge. Because uh, within India, we have seen that our knowledge is not understood. Our education system is not telling us anything about Vedas or Shastras, scriptures, anything. And, uh, and whoever knows or whoever is talking about, they are always abused by politicians by calling them X, Y, Z. Or maybe some political party has, you know, abused their not our own knowledge and our own people. So please tell us that how to, I mean, you know, put them in right frame. In fact, the world is taking the full advantage of our knowledge and we are the people who are, you know, running after the Western world and talking about this Western education system and bringing it to India, whereas our own education system is hundred times better and teaching us how to be happy. So okay. our, yeah. I got it. Yeah. So here's one thing, you know, unfortunately, she's right. And unfortunately, she's also right that when we think of yoga, we think of just hatha yoga, and we think of pranayam, and we think of what we watch on television, and we think that's yoga, but that's not, okay? Yoga is union. Yoga is the true understanding of human consciousness. Having said that, there are some really good scientists, mostly in the West, some of them Indians, by the way, because there's a scientist called Amit Goswami, who uh, was educated in uh, Shanti Niketan, then he went to Oregon University where he was a professor and he is probably the most brilliant physicist of our time because he understands consciousness. And he's a product of Shanti Niketan. There are other scientists, Western scientists, you know, Hans Peter Dürer in Germany and many others, Brian Josephson in England, 
So there are scientists who understand consciousness. Without being arrogant, I said there are no more than 10 people in the world who really understand consciousness. And I'm not being arrogant, I'm one of them. But, you know, I'm just telling you like it is. So I think the next frontier is the scientific understanding of consciousness, which is very, very germane to the Indian mind somehow. You can take an Indian child born in Las Vegas and you educate the Indian child in these ideas and you see it unfolding because it's in the sanskara. You know, it's in the, it's in the DNA, it's in the template. So I think what needs to happen is what people like Krishnamurti and others envisaged, what people like Aurobindo envisaged, what people even like Ramakrishna, Vivekananda envisaged. It did not happen because the world was not ready for it. Maybe the world is ready for it now. And, and so, uh, uh, we, 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 have to, we have to end the session. We well, will take one, one, just one question and, and, and that's question. it. Yeah, yeah, sir. I, I have to okay. go, go ahead. One last question, please. Okay. I just had a simple question. In I just one, one second. Okay, it's either. In appreciation, sir, my name is Sudhir Shah, and in appreciation, I would like to say that I'm so extremely happy to meet a Siddha Purush like you. Thank so, you. That's the question. No, question is Siddha se lakshanani yani sadhaka se sadhanani. Pratmene Sampadnani Itishravana. So sir. you being a Siddha Purush, what are your Lakshanas that we should take now at any age or any uh, state of mind? I don't Thank know you. if you are prepared to hear the answer. <laughs> I don't know if you are prepared to hear the answer. Of course, I'm absolutely. <laughs> How many people in this room, right this second, are willing to take a personal oath on non-violence in their life. Please stand up. Well, you've already transformed the world. Okay? That's it. Now live up to it. That's, now I'll tell you because, and I want this to be the last question, please, okay? Because uh, we could go on for weeks, but here's, if you, if you really mean what you say, then, um, Go to a website, it's something I started, it's called itakethevow.com. Okay, and you take this, you formalize this by signing in, and you'll get an email to get two more people to take the vow, who will then get two more people. And the idea is to get a hundred million people with this personal, forget the world, okay? You cannot fix the world, but you can fix yourself. So if you fix yourself, the world will be fixed, as you saw in that last slide. Okay? So do that, and as part of this campaign right now, which is not a campaign, it's a movement, and it's not a centralized movement, it's a non-profit worldwide movement, we will give you as much information or knowledge you want for conflict resolution, for relationship management, whether it's your personal relationships or your social relationships or your romantic relationships and this will come from experts in the world as part of this there will be music and theater and cinema that will be a, a new voice to this idea of creating a new consciousness because the really common language that the world shares is the language of art or the language of music, the language of theater, the language of movies and thank God that Bollywood is now on the world scene. So we can create a new paradigm of, of a global consciousness for a peaceful, sustainable and just and economically good world. You know, our, our Vedas say very clearly, Vasudev Kutumbukam. So let's go beyond, let's go beyond racial identity, ethnic identity, sexual identity, national identity and assume the real identity. We are global citizens and we are citizens of the cosmos. Uh, Krishna Murthy said that nationalism, extreme nationalism is tribalism. Einstein said extreme nationalism is 
the measles of humanity. It's an infantile disease. And it's from extreme nationalism is a form of incest. It's our idolatry. So let's, you know, we have a great identity as Indians, but we also have a global identity and we're showing it. You know, the Indian diaspora, right now, every seventh human being is an Indian. I travel a hundred countries, you know, in one year, and there's no place I haven't been, the smallest place in the world, where I can't find an Indian restaurant, or I can't find an Indian contact through Twitter. That's so amazing. So we are right now global. Do not think of yourself as regional. And even on our entrepreneurship, you cannot think regionally. We are global right now. And the more global we think of ourselves, the more we shift. So please, uh, this is a wonderful grassroots effort to create a new consciousness. I take the vow that um, We started it as a non-profit, Chopra Foundation. All my resources are going there at the moment. And that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So thank you and good night. God bless. Dr. Chopra, on behalf of Ty and on behalf of everybody in this hall, it is my immense pleasure to say a great thank you. You, lift, you uplifted our spirits and you brought the best out in every one of us. And just a token of appreciation, we are donating, Ty donating, um, just a small thing to a midday meal program, okay, in your honor, in your name, okay. So thank you, just love it. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, this, I, I think this brings the end to just a terrific uh, three days, and I think uh, Shida wants to just come and give some parting words, so please just stick around just for.